Welcome to another episode of the M121 podcast. Today I'm joined by Chris McCool. He's the pastor of Zion Primitive Baptist Church uh, in the Zion community in West Alabama. Uh, You can find them online at zionpbc.com. They have sermons, his Monday Minute devotionals, a lot of good content on their website. So, Brother Chris, thank you for joining me today. Thank you for having me. I've been looking forward to it. Me too. So the the way this kind of got started is uh, Chris had listened to our last podcast on becoming a primitive Baptist with Dan Sammons. And we, we talked through a little bit of that. And then I asked him if he would come on and tell us about his story. So we won't waste any time. We'll jump into it. Brother Chris, can you tell me about, um, you know, you, you haven't always been a primitive Baptist. Now you're a pastor of a primitive Baptist church. So how did you, did you grow up in church? Can you tell us about that and kind of give us your journey, how you ended up where you are? Sure. I'll be glad to. And let me say, first of all, thank you for having me. It's, uh, you're welcome. it's, to be part of this and uh, you're doing a great work up there and i think this is a good uh, a good thing for other people to maybe hear about how um how some of us weren't primitive baptist ended up becoming primitive baptist um so yeah i uh i grew up in church uh, as a young child from a, for about the first six seven maybe eight years i was in a southern baptist church um that my mother grew up in and uh but we started going to a little independent Baptist church in our community, uh, which is Zion Community. Zion Community is about 10 miles north of Gordo, Alabama, which is near Tuscaloosa. And, um, and, and really, for most of my life, actually, uh, this, uh, this area has been a little unique in that all primitive Baptist churches in Pickens County, which is where I live, and a couple of other counties that uh, border us, uh, not Tuscaloosa County, but a couple of the other West Alabama counties, there were about 15 primitive Baptist churches, and all of them, without exception, were absolute churches. They had, in the early 1900s, had drifted off into the, the, the heresy of the absolute predestination of all things, and so growing up, we knew we didn't believe that. And so actually, for <laughs> until my brother Tim McCool became a primitive Baptist, joined at uh, Bethlehem in Tuscaloosa County, uh, I thought all primitive Baptists were absoluters. I didn't know there was any difference uh, yeah. there. And uh, so uh, uh, so we knew we weren't absoluters, so that's why we weren't primitive Baptists growing up. But, but in these little, there were about 12, maybe 15 little independent Baptist churches some of them were called independent Baptists. Some were independent missionary Baptists. Some were, there's one or two sovereign grace Baptist churches. And uh, they all believed the doctrines of grace pretty much uh, in the right way. And they they had held on to those. You know, most of these churches were constituted in the, you know, early to mid 1800s. And, and, and really the only difference between them and, and primitive Baptists that I know today is that they had a piano. They didn't even have Sunday school or anything like that. And uh, and so we grew up in those churches, my brother and I did. And that's where I first heard the Doctrines of Grace preached uh, from the pulpit of Double Branch Independent Baptist Church there, which is just around the corner from the church I pastor now. Um, and um, the pastor there was uh, uh, Brother Richard Vaughn. His, his brother was uh, uh, an elder in the Primitive Baptist Church and preached there from time to time. And so anyway, we grew up there and uh, really, you know, just stayed with the with the independent Baptists all of my life. Um, and uh, my great grandfather had pastored Zion Church at the time they they slid off into absolutism. Um, that was my great grandfather McCool. My great grandfather Springer on on my mother's side was also a primitive Baptist pastor, and he pastored at. Bethlehem Primitive Baptist Church, where my brother Tim is a pastor now, and unbeknownst to me at the time, because I didn't think there was a difference, Bethlehem Church had stayed the course. They had never gone into absolutism and, in fact, broke ties of fellowship with those that had. My great-grandfather on Mama's side was the pastor when all that went down, along with another another man, and um, actually uh, brother, uh, brother Luke uh, Hagler's great-grandfather, uh, Elder Lum Burkhalter, they were they were sort of partners there in a sense, and they they kept that church from going into absolutism. So, uh, but we didn't know it at the time. So, so I grew up in these independent Baptist churches that were uh, 
not really Calvinists, but Calvinistic and, and maybe had some leanings there that we, we would not agree with today, but, but at least they preached the truth on grace. And, uh, but for the most part, they were solid, you know, they're, you know, they, they, they had, uh, that was the only place we could find the truth, you know? And so, right. uh, you know, uh, so Bethlehem so was the only church in that area that, that kind of held the course you said, and when yes. you say absolute, or you just mean the, that what they believe is that God has predestinated everything, everything that's going to happen yeah. from what you wear that day to, to where you spend eternity. That's right. It, uh, the absolute predestination of all things, including sin, that, that, that God has predestinated every action, every word we say, uh, essentially we're just puppets. And, um, and that's what, that's what they believe. Now, Bethlehem never believed that, but that was, you know, that was unbeknownst to me. We didn't realize that there was a difference. So when you, um, and most primitive Baptists don't believe in the absolute predestination of all things, but when you, when you thought of primitive Baptists, you thought they did believe in that. That's right. That's right. That's interesting. And, yeah, that's all we knew at the time. And I just thought, you know, <laughs> I knew I wouldn't, I knew I didn't believe that. So I said, well, I must not be a primitive Baptist. <laughs> and uh, uh, so that's why, we, and, and, and we had these other churches that, uh, you know, I, I mean, I really, looking back on it, can't point you to anything uh, in those churches that was really bad off. Uh, may, maybe a little bit of the, the, the idea of, of being a practical absoluter in the sense of, well, if the Lord wants them here, he'll get them here. You know, they wasn't maybe not as uh, interested in community outreach as they might should have been, but, but it wasn't, it was abs. They, they did not believe absolutists and they were very much opposed to that and, and, and did not believe that that was the correct teaching. And so that's why we, my brother and I grew up in these churches and, um, and it really wasn't until Tim went to Nashville uh, after law school and got involved in Bethel Church up there when Brother Lonnie Mazingo Jr. was pastor that that I began to see there was a difference. And um, and he did, too. He realized, obviously, you know, he was like me and and just didn't know any primitive Baptists that were uh, that were not absoluters. And so uh, but once he did that, that would have been in the, the late 90s. Um, that's when you know it kind of became a uh, uh, clear to us that, that that something was up with the primitive Baptists that we didn't know about. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. So, and you were both, I mean, faithful to the churches. I mean, you were you were a minister among the independent Baptist churches, right? Well, the way it's, uh, I actually did not, as we say, surrender to the call to preach until two thousand seven, but. From the from the age of eighteen or nineteen um, until that time, I had been speaking in these independent Baptist churches. Uh, most of them, in fact, all of them that I had been a part of, had what we called a Bible class. It wasn't Sunday school because it was all the you know the whole church together, but it was say say we'd meet at ten you know and for thirty minutes have a uh, someone teach that class, teaching a Bible class. So I didn't call it preaching, but it was teaching a Bible class. So for most of my life, uh, up until 2007, when I finally realized, yeah, the Lord was calling me to preach, um, uh, that, uh, you know, I, I was, I considered myself teaching or speaking. And so I would speak at different churches from time to time, but it, but I didn't consider it to be preaching, but yes, I was, faithful in the sense of we, we were there every Sunday, you know, and we were, we were, you know, we weren't just out of church. We were definitely in church. And, uh, and so, uh, so I guess one of the, the reasons I asked that is kind of our conversation with Dan and some others that we may talk to is, is it's yeah. interesting to me as someone who, when I was, you know, when I was blessed to come among the church, I was actually there at Bethlehem, some churches here in Birmingham. So I was, I was around 20 years old. Uh, before I had any interest in church, but I, I really primitive Baptists were there and I saw it and I never had to struggle with anything else or any other beliefs or any other churches. So it's interesting to me that people would be so convicted about what primitive primitive Baptists believe and hold to that they would leave things behind. So that's kind of right. why I asked that. Um, 
but you you when you talk about surrendering to the call to preach, so you began preaching in a in a in a in a major way or in a in a you you were called to preach among these churches in, in yes. about two thousand seven, right? That's right. That's right. Um, I'll tell you a little bit about that if, if you'd like. Yeah. Um, so, um, so in 1992, my wife and I, Sherry, we married in 1992, Valentine's Day. So, um, and that's not we, hard uh, to remember. Well, that's, you know, that's why that's, that's one of the benefits of getting married on Valentine's Day. But, but now in, in the years that have passed, as my memory begins to fail me a little bit, I realize it's a double edged sword because it's, <laughs> A narrow ditch, but it's deep. If I fall into it, I'm, <laughs> yeah, I'm you can't only, miss I, it. Yeah, I've already, I've not only forgotten uh, my anniversary, I've forgotten Valentine's Day. So. <laughs> but uh, anyway, um, so so when Sherry and I met um, and started dating in the in in 1990, she was Free Will Baptist, which is pretty diametrically opposed from uh, what I believe. You know, uh, Free Will Baptists, uh, you know, believe that. You have to exercise your will to get born again, and that you can lose your salvation if you don't, uh, you know, live right or repent. If you don't. So, so we were diametrically opposed, and and uh, but at the time, you know, I don't advise any young couple today, especially one that has come up in the church and knows the truths of grace, to, to go walking in that minefield like like we did. But the Lord was gracious to us, and um, and we were able to, you know, we, we got married. And for about 10 years, we did not see eye to eye. Uh, but we would go to my church on Sunday morning and hers on Sunday night. And um, But but obviously, there were some problems there, you know, some some places where we didn't agree. And it was, it was a big deal, uh, bigger than it appeared at the time. Uh, so, um, so like many couples that, you know, again, let me re-emphasize that that i tell my young people in our church you know get that settled before you marry <laughs> uh don't do as i did <laughs> do, right. do as I, you know because it, it is a big deal and 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 certainly we should have you know probably done more than we did but the lord blessed us uh because i also want to fast forward and say my dear wife is a very faithful happy member of the primitive baptist church today but um but but what happened was for about 10 years uh we we didn't agree on what salvation required and she uh so you know i believed as i do now that it was all solely and wholly in the hands of the lord and, and um we didn't argue we just but i'd talk we talk sometimes we would discuss it and uh finally uh, we changed the church i grew up in uh uh, well, a church, one of the churches I grew up in is where I still was at the time. And uh, I just started getting a burden to leave that church and go somewhere else, not because I had problems at that church, but I just felt I could tell looking back on it, the Lord was in it. And we we went from that church to a church called Sovereign Grace Baptist Church in near Columbus, Mississippi. And uh, the pastor there was a dear brother who's, who's still a pastor among the independent Baptists, Brother Raymond Spann. And Brother Spann had such a sweet um, disposition and a, and a sweet delivery that I think it probably, I see now the Lord working and getting us over there under his ministry because it was within a year that, that Sherry came to see the Doctrines of Grace and decided it was time to join that church. And so, uh, and, and, and let me just say, Brother Spann is as gun barrel straight on grace as any primitive Baptist preacher I know. He, uh, you know, he understands the purpose of the gospel, and there's no uh, no issues with him. And so we began to really grow under his ministry at, at that time, and that was about 2001. So in 2005 or so, I went to Sherry, and I said, you know, what would, I, what would you say if I told you I felt like the Lord was calling me to preach? And she, her eyes got pretty wide, and she <laughs> said, uh, I'd say I didn't marry a preacher. <laughs> So I kind of let it drop at that point, and I because I wasn't sure either, and uh, I kept, uh, you know, dealing with it. Of course, looking back on it, when I was eighteen or nineteen years old, he was dealing with me. There's no doubt in my mind that that he was dealing with me that far back. And uh, things kept going, and I kept making excuses. And uh, I, I talked with my brother Tim a little bit. I told him, you know, I just don't 
think I'm qualified. I don't think this. I told him one. I told him one time. I said, Tim, I just think I'm too fat to be a preacher. <laughs> he said. Uh, he said, Do you know how many fat preachers I know? <laughs> <laughs> so anyway. <laughs> so and and for those that don't know, I mean, at this point, uh, brother Tim, your brother, yeah. your your brother is um, is pastor in that Bethlehem Church that you mentioned right. earlier. That's right. He came back from at Nashville in 1999. Uh, uh, I credit Brother Lonnie Mazingo uh, with Lord using him to get Tim back home because um, he's very much, uh, Tim grew. He, he never joined Bethel Church. He really arrived at, at the church up there with, under Brother Lonnie. And to this day, he's such a dear friend of all of us. But Brother Lonnie encouraged him when he, he had this idea of going home. And Tim came home. 1999, he joined Bethlehem, and I think in 2002, he became their pastor. Uh, he surrendered to the call to preach at some point before that and was ordained. And, uh, so, uh, yes, Tim um, So Tim and I talked a lot, and he used to tell me I was the best recruiter for the Primitive Baptists to be a non-Primitive Baptist. Because <laughs> <laughs> I, I was, at that time, I had started going to a church uh, after 2007. I started going to a church up in Arab, Alabama, which is a sweet sweet church that uh, that believed just doctrines of grace just as solid as they could in fact that's at that church that's the first time i ever heard the term time salvation i didn't know what they were talking about till they explained it and i realized oh okay yeah that's exactly what i believe you know uh, uh you know that et- there's eternal salvation that's solely and wholly in the hands of the lord and then there's time salvation that in large part depends upon whether we are obedient or not you know so say right from this untoward generation and so forth so um so anyway i but but people around home that was three hours away so when people around home but we'd start talking about the doctors of grace i said well go to bethlehem and <laughs> go to bethlehem so, so um uh so anyway i through tim's um you know counsel and continuing to to see what you know the, the growth at bethlehem and seeing what was happening there i knew i knew that um uh, that the primitive Baptists were different than what we'd grown up thinking. And, and just slowly over that time, it dawned on me that, you know, we're, we're very close now. Now, quite frankly, that made it a little harder for me to, to, to end up uh, coming over because I think if I'd been a rank Armenian, I had, I would have easily just said, Oh yeah, come on, let's baptize me and let's go. But because I had grown up believing the truth and I was so close, I struggled a little bit with the rebaptism part, but I finally came to see that that it didn't matter. That I just needed. To, when the Lord began to impress on me that Zion was where I needed to be, man, I would have stood on my head and ran around the church seven times or done whatever it took to become a member because I realized that's where I needed to be. Hey, and uh, let's talk about I, that for just a second, brother Chris, because sure. um, if if you're not familiar with Primitive Baptist, um, if he mentioned rebaptism, and what what we mean by that is if you were to join a primitive Baptist church, you would be baptized. And if you had been baptized in, say, a Southern Baptist church or a Methodist church or a Presbyterian church, uh, you would be baptized again. And I've seen that be a hang-up for people. And in in some ways, uh, you know, I, I wholeheartedly endorse it and um, believe that, that it's— uh, it's safe and scriptural, um, and I think it's almost a a barrier that the Lord has has put in. If you're not willing to do that, then you probably haven't seen the church for what it really is, and and the truth for what it really is in some ways. But so you, you did, just you have any counsel to people that are struggling with that? Because I've known people that don't that have been baptized in another faith, you know, another Christian denomination. When they find out they have to be rebaptized, as we call it, or baptized again, uh, when they join a primitive Baptist church, it's kind of a struggle for them. So, do you have any counsel on that uh, to those that may be listening? Yes, I do, uh, because I struggled with it. I, I and you know, I was, of course, we were kind of in a unique situation uh, here in our area, where there were there were about, as I said, twelve or fifteen independent Baptist churches that were not part of the Southern Baptist Convention or any other convention who had mostly all been constituted in the early 1800s, uh, some even before the split, before there was a, you know, a primitive Baptist name used at all before 1832. I know one church was 
I believe constituted in 1824 that's in our area. And so, um, you know, I, I struggle with the fact that, that uh, like the church I was baptized into came out of a church that had been constituted, you know, at a time when, uh, you know, I, I, I felt certain I could trace the lineage right. and be able to show that this was indeed a true church. Um, and, and, and let me just say this, this might help also some of the listeners. These churches look like what we call progressive primitive Baptist churches today. That is, they, they had a piano. One of them, but only one of them I know of, had, had a Sunday school. And but most of them had a Bible class of some sort, but not all of them. So, but they were they were really close to primitive Baptists. They weren't called primitive, but they were, you know, would essentially be, as I said, a, what we would think of as a progressive primitive Baptist church today. Did these churches associate with each other? They did. They okay. they were not in a any you know it was a loose association, a fellowship, almost like they, primitive Baptist. That's right, exactly like primitive Baptist, and. Uh, um, in fact, there's one or two of those churches that I that I've you know been to uh, for some special meeting because I have good friends there you know and and if you go back and look at them they're they're they feel they the the fellowship and the and the simplicity of the worship apart from the musical instrument is just really close to us you know uh, really close to primitive Baptist so so I had that experience of okay I grew up in a church that probably you know, I could, if I got down to it, could trace the lineage back before the split. I was baptized in one of those churches. I believed almost identically. In fact, by the time I surrendered to preach, I was preaching and believing identically to what the primitive Baptists believe. And so my, my problem was, as I said, if I'd been a rank Armenian, I probably would have just said, sure, let me jump in the water. I'm ready to go. But I was like, why should I have to get rebaptized when when we can trace it out like that. And so, you know, I struggled with that for a little while, uh, just from a personal standpoint. And I, under, so I understand the struggle. I get it that people who, who are, uh, considering joining, but have been baptized in another order might have a little problem with it. So I, I get it, but this is what I did that, that got me to the point where I did, um, I did agree wholeheartedly to be rebaptized, and that's why we insist on it at our church, you know, today. So first of all, you got to ask a question: Is it scriptural? Okay, anything you do, you know, our, right. you know, our article of faith, our only rule of faith and practice is scripture. So I got to reading, and I went over to Acts, the 19th chapter, where uh, Paul went into Ephes Ephesus, where Apollos had been, uh, and had. Um, you know, he asked me, he said, have you received the Holy Ghost? And they said, we don't even know what it is. You know, what's the Holy Ghost? And, and I, you know, you and I both know they're not talking about the new birth there. They're talking about the special leadership of the Holy, Holy right. Ghost. The gift of the Holy Ghost. Or... That's it, the gift of the Holy Ghost. It was especially manifest in that early church. And, and, and so then he asked him, he said, under what then were you baptized? They said, under John's baptism. Well, you know. I don't ever criticize somebody's prior baptism. I may have my own opinion about whether it's valid or not, but I've never found it productive to go to somebody and say, you haven't been properly baptized, you know, so right. that's between them and the Lord. And it meant something to them. So I, you know, uh, well here we have John's baptism, which is pretty, I'd say that's pretty sound baptism. <laughs> you know, that, That's how they were baptized under John's baptism. Paul didn't, you know, jump up in their face and get, all in the, you know, all critical and legalistic, but he just he says the next verse just says, uh, you know, Paul said, okay, John baptized with the baptism of repentance, uh, uh, and when they heard that, he said they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. So he just he just rebaptized them. So rebaptism is scriptural. Rebaptism is definitely scriptural. Paul did it in Acts 19. There. Then I got to thinking, okay, now why should I do it? And, and, if you remember, I, I don't remember the exact uh, location in the scripture, but there was a place where, where Paul circumcised Timothy. Okay. Well, we all agree that circumcision is not necessary to, to, to be a child of God. And, and Paul wasn't saying it was. But if you remember, Paul, uh, Timothy's father was Greek. His mother was Jewish. And, and Timothy was going to be ministering and preaching among those Jews. And so I looked at that and I said, you know, that's a good example of where um, Paul decided, I believe Paul decided to just take away that issue. 
you know, like for instance, for me, you know, maybe I could sit down with you and convince you that my, my baptism when I was 19 in an independent Baptist church was scriptural and sound and the church was okay. And you should accept it. Maybe I could do that. Maybe I couldn't, but I don't have to. Right. Because I was baptized at Zion primitive Baptist church, um, in, in, um, in 2011. So that is all taken away. And so ultimately it came down to this, Lord, where do you want me? And, and I knew he wanted me at Zion church and that was a requirement and it was done. You know, you can, we can argue about whether my first baptism was valid or not. Some would say it isn't. Some would say it is. I've got my opinion about it, but it doesn't matter because I have been baptized at Zion primitive Baptist church and that issue is forever taken away. And now the fellow for fellowship's sake, it's important. You know, we had a, a member at our church that was in your similar situation and mm-hmm. he wasn't a member at that time. And, and when he came to join the church, you know, he knew he'd have to be baptized in the church and he'd been baptized in a, in a, in a Southern Baptist church. And, and I thought it was so sweet when he came down, it's basically what you're saying. He said, you know, for the, the sake of the unity of the fellowship, I want to do this. Um, hey, and I hey, thought man. that was such a great spirit um, and attitude to have. And same thing that you're saying. So I didn't mean to go down that road, but I think that is something that, that sure. maybe is unique to Primitive Baptist in some ways that, that right. people struggle with. And so uh, maybe well, maybe the Lord will bless this conversation. Yeah, well, you know, I mean, I have people a lot of times say, you know, we shouldn't have nominations and all that. And I agree, we should. But the, the truth of the matter is we live in a fallen world. And what the what names, I don't consider us to be a denomination, but we do have a name on the church of Primitive Baptists. And I think that's important because, you know, if, if we could just say we're the church of God in Christ at Zion, that would be ideal. But but we can't because that doesn't identify us. And, and I think it's important that we be identified. And if we, if we want to join with one of these churches, that's identifiable by the name primitive Baptist, we need to, we need to follow through with what, uh, what's required, uh, what the practice is. Uh, so I, and I think it's a good practice myself. Well, let's, let's move on. So, you were preaching at the church in, in Arab, and at some point you you left there and joined a primitive Baptist church. Um, how did that happen, and what was it that kind of sparked, you know, what was sure. it that made you do that? Well, all right, so um, <laughs> I could go on for a long time about this, but let me try to shorten it as best I can. Um, I thought the Lord wanted me at that church in Arab. And so I preached at that church as sort of their unofficial interim pastor for about two years. And then I, I quit. I quit going to the church for a while. Uh, and then I went back and um, and 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 essentially, without going into too many details, I was looking for signs uh, because I love the church. I love the people. And as I said, they stood for the truth of grace as strong as any independent Baptist church I'd ever been associated with. They, they wouldn't they knew the purpose of the gospel was not to in any way affect the new birth, but it was simply to illuminate the life and immortality that was there uh, based on the new birth. So uh, I kept struggling with that. I, I talked to some of the primitive Baptist ministers. I talked to my brother. I talked to Elder Mike Ivey and others. And um, of course, they were all wanting me to come over to the primitive Baptist church. But um and, and ultimately, that's what I did. But, but I jo- I actually decided to accept that church, and I told the church that I would do that, that I would become their pastor. I was getting ready to move up there. I was at the time I was my secular job was as district attorney in our area there, and I was getting ready to resign. And we we're going to move up there three hours away. And uh, <laughs> by the time I got home that night after that Sunday, when I had told them I would accept it, I knew something wasn't right, and after a few days passed, it was like the Lord had clean gone forever. If I've ever experienced the chastening of God, I experienced it then. And it got so bad, Brother Josh, that after about three weeks, two and a half weeks, I went to the doctor and I told my doctor, as he's asking me what's wrong, I said, well, you know, doc, my head hurts, my chest hurts, my stomach hurts, I can't eat, I can't sleep. 
he's writing all this down. And I said, oh, by the way, I think I'm out of the will of God. <laughs> he, he stopped and looked up. He said, no, I can't help you with that one. <laughs> <laughs> and so uh, that kind of was like a light going on in my head. So I called that church back and really hurt me to do it because I loved them. But I told them I did the wrong thing. And so in the meantime, in the meantime, Zion Primitive Baptist Church, where I am now, had been an absoluter church since my great-grandfather, McCool, had let them drift off into that back in the 1930s or so, 40s, and, and others, not just him, but he was the pastor in that time frame. And so, but the church had slowly just gotten, you know, lost members, lost members, and it got down to one member, my aunt, uh, Aunt Lorene Deason, uh, my dad's oldest uh, sister. She was from 2005 when my grandmother died to 2011. She was the only member. But she had, when her husband died, she had remarried uh, Uncle Mackie Deason, who was a member at Bethlehem, where they, they were preaching the correct thing. Tim was a pastor. And she started going there, and she realized there's something different here, and there's something wrong with where I, we are as far as our beliefs go. I need to make some changes. And she, she talked with Tim, my brother, and, and eventually in um, June of 2011, they started having special services on the first and third Sunday nights. And Tim was, she had got Tim to be in charge of that. And so beginning in June, we started having those services. I would go and attend those services and uh, just begin to see, you know, begin to feel something stirring about Zion. Now it was even, it was July of 2011 when I told the church I would come up in Arab. So I was still not following the Lord like I should because I, I, I think that may be the, anyway, the last gasp effort for me to not be primitive Baptist. And I don't mean, yeah. myself, you know, just kind of uh, confused. I was confused at that point. So anyway, as the church began to clear, the, I mean, we began to have good crowds of people coming from the community and all that. And, uh, and it just kept impressing on me that this is where I need to be. Uh, and, and to make a long story short, my wife, who had already converted to belief in the truth and joined the other independent Baptist church. She and I weren't quite on the same page about Zion. And, um, but she gave me the best advice that a wife could ever give a husband. And I was stunned when she told me that I kept, I kept talking to her, Sherry, don't you feel it too? Don't you feel it too? She said, I just don't feel it. I don't feel it. And then one day when I was bugging her about that, <laughs> she said, uh, look, I don't feel it, but you're the leader lead us wow and the boy you talking about stunned look on my face i was like uh wait a minute <laughs> absolutely right and uh and i'll never forget that she still even when i the first sunday night in october of 2011 elder sam bryant pastor there you know it know him well <laughs> where you are that's right elder sam bryant was preaching and i i i just i don't even know what he's preaching on but i i was so convicted uh, I just kept struggling. I'd already struggled a couple of weeks earlier with not that uh, maybe I need to join, but I didn't. And I finally, when they, when my brother Tim opened the doors of the church, I, I came down. I was the, I was the third member. Um, and, and just to back up and fill in the blank in August, the first Sunday night in August, Aunt Lorene converted the church from absolute, uh, from the absolute predestination belief that they had been in severed ties with all the absoluters and sent out letters to reestablish ties with the, with the solid churches in our area, the old mainline primitive Baptists. And, uh, so she converted the church the first Sunday night in August, uncle Mackie joined. So, uh, doubled the membership in one day. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so there were two members at that point. I became the third member in October when I joined and, uh, and we, and I guess they say the rest is history. I, I was ordained in March. I, I, I mentioned that Sherry wasn't necessarily in agreement that night. I mean, she wasn't against it, but she just didn't see it too. By the time I was ordained in March, the third Saturday in March, she had joined and all four of my children had joined and they had waited about being baptized so I could do it. So I was ordained on a Saturday and on Sunday morning over at Bethlehem church. Cause we didn't have a baptistry. Uh, I baptized my whole family and, yes. um, been great that's a wonderful story of of um god's just grace isn't it i mean 
That's wonderful, Brother Chris. I was going to ask you, mm-hmm. because one thing, you mentioned your children there. One thing, yeah, at Primitive Baptist, you know, if, if you're not familiar with them, most people listening to this probably are, but they may say, well, there's not a lot for the children. You know, it's a family integrated type ch- church, and so the family's all together, and there, you've mentioned Sunday schools. We don't have Sunday schools for the children, and and right. so the world may look at it and say there's not much for the kids. But how did that impact your family, especially your children? Um, you know, how did how did your decision to lead? I love what uh, I love. I mean, you're the leader, so lead us. So when you led yeah. you led your family, um, mm-hmm. how has that worked out for you know for your children and and specifically for you? What? You know, was it one of the questions I asked Dan was was it worth it? And um, so kind of kind of end us with with that. How has it worked out for your family and for you? If I have Brother Josh, if I if I can say it without choking up, I can tell you that if I've ever followed the leading of the Lord, I followed it then, and I have never regretted it. My children are as the happiest primitive Baptists that I've ever seen. <laughs> and in fact, uh, in fact, the three I have four children: two boys and two girls. Um, my oldest daughter and is is married. Uh, to a young man, John Morgan Owens, who came out of the Presbyterian Church and and just completely converted over, um, and and now we're going to ordain him in May of this year as a as an elder. And um, my my oldest son married a, a young a wonderful young lady whose father is a Primitive Baptist preacher over in Georgia. Uh, he grew up in the Primitive Baptist Church. My youngest daughter married a young man who joined our church who is actually the son of my oldest best friend. Uh, his father and I grew up together, and uh, and they're all members of the church. Uh, I have not, my youngest son is uh, uh, not married, but he's just, he loves the Primitive Baptist Church. Um, I, I just can't even emphasize how, what a what a what an awesome experience we've had and how the Lord has blessed us, and I have not regretted it one time. Um, I'll say this, you know, we had we experienced quite a bit of growth pretty quickly. We we went from the the one member Aunt Lorraine to about thirty members in about a year and a half to two years. And um, I've always kind of joked around and said, you know, at Bethlehem where my brother is pastor, they've had amazing growth. And it, it over a ten, twelve, fifteen year, what twenty years now, uh, but it, they really saw a lot of growth. And it took about ten or fifteen years to really see that. And I. I've always said that was a testament to, you know, the Lord's, the Lord's grace and Tim's, my brother's faithfulness. But in our case, um, that quick growth, I've always said was a testimony to the Lord's grace and to my lack of faithfulness. I think the Lord looked down and said, we're going to have to help that old boy out pretty quick <laughs> to discourage. <laughs> so, so the Lord sent us a lot of members pretty quick. So, uh, but, uh, but we have, we have grown and I, I kid about that, but the Lord has been so good to us. And and most of our members are, did not grow up in a primitive Baptist church. They they most of them have come from either independent Baptist churches or other churches in our area, and uh, so we've been greatly blessed. And not once have any of us in our family looked back. Well, this is, um, I guess, a stereotype, and it and, and it's not um, it's not something that applies to everybody. But one of the reasons one of the reasons I wanted to start talking to people like you like Dan, and we'll try to do others this year, is that I have noticed, it's an observation, that a lot of people who grew up Primitive Baptist just don't seem to be as excited or content as those who did not and later became Primitive Baptist. And, right. um, you know, I think it's one of those things you don't know what you got till it's gone or you don't know what you've got until you've, you've done something else. So I hope that these conversations will will not only... Uh, help people who may be in your shoes that are that are not familiar with Primitive Baptist or kind of on the fence about it, and and yeah. and they'll see the blessing that that with you, brother Dan, that we had last last month. Uh, but then people like me who have really not known anything else, mm-hmm. um, I would just my counsel to those people would be like, you know, count your blessings. Uh, we really Amen. do have uh, the kingdom Amen. of God, and it's Amen. it's an amazing thing. Yes, and and I'll say this, um, you know, we say all the time we haven't been here long enough to take it, start taking taking it for granted. We really have, and we have to be careful though. And uh, and I also want to say this, going back to, um, you know, my story about how I came from the Independent Baptist here, 
I, I want to make it clear. I didn't leave the independent Baptist because I, I didn't love those folks. There's a lot of sweet, godly, precious truth believers still in, in those churches. Um, and, um, you know, some of the pre there, there's most of the preachers in our area, at least that, that, um, are in that independent Baptist and sovereign grace Baptist, uh, group. Um, mo- many of them have gone into, um, uh, you know, gospel regeneration, things like that, that, that they not necessarily understanding the purpose of the gospel, but there's a few that are still there that are faithful. And, and so I'm not criticizing those dear brothers at all. Uh, but I do believe that, that we have got the kingdom of God in a special way here that, that you won't find anywhere else. And I'm so thankful for that. Uh, I agree. And, and none of this is to criticize anyone. I, um, Right. There are there are so many people in so many denominations that would make me look like a bad Christian. <laughs> I mean, yeah. Uh, yeah. that's well, anyway, uh, that's that not even a question. The, that was one of the struggles I had in leaving. Is that I knew, uh, you know, I I ne- didn't want them to not have some. Not that I was a great preacher, but I just, you know, I knew I was preaching the truth of grace and understood the purpose of the gospel. And there were a lot out there that didn't. And I. I struggled with leaving the, the folks there behind, but it, but once you figure out where the Lord wants you, you better go because you'll never be satisfied unless you do. Well, that's that's good advice, and I think you've done that. And brother Chris, I appreciate it. Um, maybe we can have you back sometime. Uh, I, I just I hope that the Lord will bless this conversation as we distribute it uh, out as a podcast here in just a few days. Yes, sir. Well, thank you so much for having me, Brother Josh, and I appreciate your faithfulness to to doing this. Well, God bless you, brother. Yes, sir.